In this video, we're going to go over eukaryotic gene expression. The first thing I want to start off by discussing is the fact that eukaryotic mRNA is mostly monocystronic. That means that each mRNA molecule can only code for a single protein product. This is different from prokaryotes that have polycystronic mRNA, where each mRNA molecule can encode for multiple protein products. In many ways, this is efficient for prokaryotes, because if they want to carry out a particular biochemical pathway, they only have to synthesize a single mRNA molecule to produce all of the proteins necessary for that pathway. In eukaryotes, it's more difficult and complex. To carry out a particular biochemical pathway, eukaryotes have to produce a separate mRNA molecule for each protein required in that pathway. Now, there are some pros to this approach. Eukaryotes, unlike prokaryotes, can be multicellular organisms, and by having each protein product under the control of a separate mRNA and promoter, it allows different cells to express different combinations of proteins more easily, allowing for more diversity in gene expression. The downside, of course, to this system is that gene expression regulation is far more complex in eukaryotes than prokaryotes. So in this video, we're really only going to go over the basics that you need to know for the MCAT. So in terms of transcriptional regulation, there's many ways that this can be done in eukaryotes. One method is through the regulation of chromatin structure. As you recall from our previous videos, chromatin is DNA wrapped around histone proteins. One way of altering chromatin structure is by the addition or removal of acetyl groups on histone proteins. This can alter the accessibility of DNA by RNA polymerase, and that in itself will alter the amount of gene transcription. Another method of altering histone structure is by histone methylation. Here, instead of adding or removing acetyl groups, Histomethylation is looking at adding or removing methyl groups from histone proteins. And here, it can result in either increases or decreases in gene expression. You want to be a little careful, and that's because we have discussed methylation before, but it was a different type of methylation. DNA methylation typically silences gene expression by adding methyl groups on DNA. All right, so that's the difference. DNA methylation, you're adding methyl groups on DNA. Histomethylation, you're adding or removing methyl groups on histone proteins. All right, another method of altering gene transcription levels is through the use of transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that can bind to DNA sequences called promoters or enhancer regions. And when transcription factors bind to DNA, they can either increase or decrease gene expression. And in this diagram, we have one example of this. Here you can see how upon the binding of transcription factors to the promoter region of a gene, it will increase the affinity of RNA polymerase for that promoter. By increasing the affinity of RNA polymerase for that promoter, it will result in increased transcription of that gene. Okay, so next we can look at gene amplification or duplication. This involves duplicating a region of DNA, which you can see on this diagram. When you duplicate a region of DNA, and that duplication includes the promoter as well as the entire coding region, it's possible that this results in increased expression of that protein product, just by virtue of the fact that you may produce twice as many mRNA molecules and twice as many protein products. Now, gene duplication is not something that occurs very often. It can occur as a result of an error in DNA replication. So this does happen, but it's not super common. All right. So next, let's look at alternative splicing. We've discussed splicing before. This is the process by which the pre-mRNA molecule that is transcribed by mRNA is processed. And in splicing, the introns are the nucleotide sequences that are removed, 
and the exons are the nucleoside sequences that are kept. Alternative splicing refers to the fact that different combinations of introns and exons can be kept or removed in a pre-mRNA molecule. And you can see how that works in this diagram, where you have one DNA sequence transcribed to pre-mRNA and then spliced in three different ways to produce three different protein products from the same gene. This is actually very powerful for eukaryotes because eukaryotes, if you want them to have a lot of diversity in the protein products, then you would need to have a lot of genes. But through alternative splicing, eukaryotes can produce multiple protein products from one gene. So thereby increasing the efficiency of eukaryotes in gene expression. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about today is non-coding RNAs. So non-coding RNAs are essentially the RNA molecules that do not code for proteins. They are not mRNA molecules. And here are the non-coding RNAs involved with gene expression. So tRNAs or transfer RNAs, as you recall, these are responsible for bringing amino acids to ribosomes during translation. Ribosomal RNA, rRNA, are one of the components of ribosomes. SNRNA, small nuclear RNAs, are a component of the spliceosome for RNA splicing. And finally, miRNA or microRNA, these are short fragments of RNA that will hybridize to complementary sequences on mRNA. And when they bind to complementary mRNA sequence, they block translation of that gene. So miRNAs are one way of silencing gene expression.